So uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, so one of the cornerstones of the Learning to Compete program has been uh, a careful analysis of exporting behavior of firms. Uh, and uh, that has resulted in five uh, academic papers that uh, will hopefully be published in a special issue of the Journal of African Economies in due course. Uh, and I thought I'd summarize a little bit about what these papers are doing. I should be very clear that I have not uh, written any of these papers. I am just uh, the editor of, of this special issue. Uh, <coughs> and indeed, uh, John Rand, Carol, and Finn uh, have uh, contributed to these papers. So I should certainly not take a lot of credit for this. I'm very happy to take uh, some blame if there's anything wrong with them uh, as, as, as it goes. So we have five countries, uh, two middle-income countries, Tunisia and Vietnam, and three low-income countries, Mozambique, Ethiopia, uh, and, uh, and Kenya. So we thought this is a, a nice mix of countries. Uh, they differ, of course, but they don't differ too much uh, in the sense that you know, it will still be informative uh, to do some kind of comparative analysis here, uh, with especially, focusing especially on exporting uh, mechanisms. So manufacturing is relatively large in Tunisia and Vietnam, 17%. Uh, Kenya and Mozambique, around the average for sub-Saharan Africa, 11%. And Ethiopia, much, much lower. It's come down now to 4%. Uh, I'm talking now about the share of, of manufacturing in, in GDP. If you look at, I'm just going through sort of the, the macro numbers. So manufacturing exports per, per capita, that would come out at around $100 in Tunisia and, and Vietnam and around uh, $4 in Ethiopia. So there are these big differences across the, the countries. And so the overall goal of what we have tried to do uh, in, in this part of the program is to understand better, well, first of all, why some firms exports and others don't. Um, how firms develop after they have broken into exports market uh, and how they grow. So sort of to, to sort of drill down on what are the benefits to the individual firm from engaging with the international market. Uh, and as you shall see a little later, that's one of the, the things that we have some, some quite interesting results on. And of course, since we have the five countries, we can also say something about on the one hand, what is common, what appears to be common across these countries, uh, for example, with respect to the, the consequences, the benefits of exporting. And on the other hand, in what, what types of mechanisms appear to be very country specific? I think that's quite interesting because then that might feed into a, a policy uh, discussion in due course. So we we'll just go through, through the, the stylized facts. So five countries, as I say, uh, panel data are available for all of them. Uh, the time dimension in these panels vary from three or four years uh, in, in, uh, in, I think, one case to up to uh, a decade uh, of data for, for Ethiopia, I believe. And across all the countries, the, the basic stylized facts are the same. So exporting firms are larger, more capital intensive, tend to be much more productive, pay higher wages, are more modern than non-exporting firms. And that's pretty well known. But, so then how do firms become exporters? How do we get, sort of get the ball rolling? So if only 5% of the firms in Ethiopia export, how can we get that number up to 10%? Well, that turns out to be a very difficult thing to do because breaking into exports markets is very difficult. Uh, and it, as it seems, very, very costly. So just to take an example, uh, to give you a, a number, just to illustrate orders of magnitude, if you look at the Ethiopian sample, take a baseline likelihood of exporting is around 5%. If you could move that firm into the export markets exogenously, the likelihood that it would continue to be in the export market would be 50% in the next uh, period. So that's kind of interesting from a policy point of view, because if you can somehow move these firms into the export market so that they can adjust their organization, their technology, and more generally their outlook, um, chances are that they will stay there. And there are 
many good reasons why we want them to stay there. I mean, one reason is that, of course, they get access to bigger markets, all these well-known uh, consequences. That's not what we've chosen to focus on here. We've chosen to uh, ask the question whether they actually learn, perform better as a result of interacting with foreign buyers and being present in foreign markets. Um, and it looks as though that's very much the case. So if you look at learning effects, by which I mean essentially uh, productivity gains that we see evolving sort of dynamically after entry into exporting, these are very large. They're actually much larger than what previous studies have implied. Uh, so using sort of modern econometric techniques, a uh, ballpark number would be around 20%. Five minutes. Five minutes. So again, coming back to the Ethiopian firm that initially baseline case, very unlikely to export. If I can sort of move it into the export market, it's very likely to stay there. And it's also likely then to see its productivity grow by about 20% in due course. Um, foreign ownership plays an important role in the context. So firms with domestic ownership are at a serious disadvantage when it comes to their ability to enter the uh, export market. So FDI probably is something that policymakers should embrace. When there are many reasons for embracing FDI, here's another one that it actually can get the ball rolling when it comes to promoting exports in the local market. There is even some evidence in one of the countries that we've looked at uh, of spillover effects, so that the exporting decisions and the R&D decisions made by foreign firms spill over onto the decisions and behavior of local firms. I should stress there that there are some, some country differences. Uh, certainly, again, coming back to Ethiopia, for example, there is very little foreign ownership. So that does not seem to be a very promising avenue for, for spurring up exports at the moment. Um, and I think what we've learned more generally is that getting firms into the export markets, there, there isn't like a, a, a common um, recipe for doing that. The exports model, if you think in terms of you know, econometric model, looks very different across all the five countries that we have looked at. However, the consequences of exporting are very similar across all the five countries. So there are many different ways of getting there, but it looks as though what you get out of it in terms of productivity gains is actually quite similar uh, across the countries. Then the various papers have sort of uh, chosen to pursue different uh, sort of avenues of, of, of probing, I suppose. Um, one interesting um, issue that has been explored for Vietnam and Tunisia is to look at the role played by innovation in this context. And here we get into a discussion as to how does this learning happen? Is it sort of, does it happen automatically so in the form of passive learning? Or do the firms have to actually engage in other parallel activities in order to reap the benefits from exporting? And there are some signs that if you simultaneously engage in R&D, for example, or if you hire engineers uh, and, and sort of uh, move quite deliberately to a more sophisticated process and, and type of product, then the gains from exporting tend to be higher. I will only need one, I think. So I'm going to uh, sum up just to give you, since I don't have slides, I'll give you three, three bullet points. Um, so big differences between exporters and non-exporters uh, across the countries. Um, the driving factors of exports differ a lot across countries. So policymakers who are interested in the question, how do I get firms into the export market, should probably base uh, you know, their thinking on country-specific analysis. Um, but as I say, a common result across all the countries is that the exporting results in productivity gains. Uh, those gains are also somewhat heterogeneous. They can be particularly strong. For example, in one of the countries, we find that it is uh, small firms in particular that uh, 
make strong productivity gains as a result of getting into the export market. So um, bottom line, the old truth seems to hold. Um, promoting exports is a pretty sound development policy, it seems. Um, but I'm sure we'll come back to that issue and discuss it more a little later. So thank you. <laughs>